transverse standing, standing waves uh, form the basis for Western music. They really do. So we're going to talk about nodes and anti-nodes. We're, we're going to talk about the standing wave patterns that you can get on, on a string with fixed ends. And we'll find that there's a, a distinct number of, well actually an infinite number, of different standing wave patterns that you can produce on a string. And we'll talk about the, the harmonic series that results from it. <coughs> so let's first uh, just show what this de uh, video demonstrates is what you get when, when two people are holding the ends of a rope and one is jiggling his end at a certain speed. And so if you do it at a really slow speed, you can get a pattern that looks like this. If you do it at a uh, higher speed than that, you can have it vibrating in two lobes where there's a middle point and then there's two places here. If you do it even faster, you can get it vibrating in three lobes, etc. If I send a rhythmic pulse, it reflects on itself. This is the fundamental mode. Sending the pulse at twice the frequency results in the second harmonic. If I triple the frequency, I get the third harmonic. So you can see that that string is vibrating in three segments called lobes. Um, so what we saw in the video was something like what you see here. <coughs> And the first thing I'd like to do is to define nodes, N-O-D-E-S, and anti-nodes for standing wave patterns. So this is a, those, those patterns that you saw, they weren't going anywhere. It, it, it wasn't a traveling wave. This is um, a standing wave now, which actually you can show that if you have a, a, a wave propagating to the left and a wave, an identical wave propagating to the right and you add those two together, the result is a standing wave that doesn't really go anywhere. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. So let's first define the nodes and anti-nodes. Nodes are places where there's no vibration. So this is a node, this is a node, and there are also nodes at the end of the string because we're talking about a string with fixed ends. Um, and one way to remember the word nodes is the word, the, the N-O part of it means no vibration, right? Now that's what, the way I think about it anyway. Anti-nodes are just the opposite. That's where there's maximum vibration. In fact, points along a standing wave vibrate with different amplitudes. Not so with the traveling wave. If you have a, a traveling wave and you, you jiggle that rope up and down, then, then the wave propagates along and every point on that wave oscillates, every little particle on that wave oscillates in simple harmonic motion with the same amplitude. Not so with standing waves. These two points have large amplitudes. Uh, this point of string here, as it goes up and back and forth, it makes a big excursion. These points uh, at the nodes don't move at all. They stay there forever. And um, so that's where we're talking about different amplitudes at different points along a standing wave. Okay, so the, this next demonstration is to investigate how a pulse remains upright after reflecting from a free end and how it flips over after re reflecting from a fixed end. So we're going to send a pulse to the end of this, uh, end of this um, it's called a shive wave machine. There's a, there's a wire, or a rod, that runs through the middle of this and attached to that rod are other rods so that when, when this rod moves this way it twists the middle rod um, OK. 
Okay. Okay, so what, what you're looking at here is um, Let me actually back that up. So this first one is where you start a wave, a pulse from one end, and you're asking how it reflects off of a free end. So you start it, you jiggle this up and down, you create this positive pulse of a peak that travels to the other end, and we're asking what happens when it reflects from this free end. This free end is not attached to anything. It is it's just free. So actually, we didn't see the beginning of that. Let me back it up to here. Oh, here we go. Okay, there's a pulse. It starts out positive, it comes back positive. I think you can see that it's staying a peak, even after reflecting. Now, at this point, we've added uh, something rigid here, a, a rod here that's holding this end fixed. And we're gonna ask what happens to that peak when it comes down to that end. Here's a peak. What is it now? It's a valley. So when reflected from a rigid end, what was a positive pulse becomes a negative pulse. When reflected from a free end, a positive pulse gets reflected as a positive pulse. Okay, so the, when you have a fixed end, as we see here, a positive pulse travels over, hits that fixed end where the, the string or whatever it is you're, you're sending the wave through is attached to something solid here. And if it's fixed, then that positive peak gets reflected as a negative and comes back. It gets tipped over. So, and the interesting thing about standing waves is that, as you saw in those standing waves that we demonstrated at the beginning, um, it, it all vibrates as a unit in a nice uniform way and what's happening actually is that positive pulse gets reflected from the fixed end and reflected as a negative pulse in exactly the right timing so that all the whole string can move in, in unison. And that's why the statement here, if the timing is right, the original and the reflected pulses reinforce each other and that creates a large amplitude standing wave. Okay, so this, this concept has some meat to it. And and I think it's fun too. I think it's uh, nice for you to be able to derive, do a little bit of math here to understand these standing waves. And uh, on this one, we're gonna draw the first three standing wave patterns for a string with fixed ends. Those are the three that we saw already in the video and in a slide a couple slides ago. Then we're gonna write the wavelength and frequency for each pattern in terms of the string length L and the wave speed V, and then we're gonna name these patterns. Each of them has a name. So I've already done the first and third parts of this for you. Uh, I'd like you to be able to do this yourself. But just to save uh, time on the presentation, I've done the first part for you. So these are the drawings of the first three standing wave patterns. This is a fixed end. This is a fixed end. This uh, black curve is a snapshot of the of the string when it reaches its maximum position and this dotted line represents also a snapshot of the string but when it's at its minimum position and its neutral position is right here so if it weren't being 
and vibrate it up and down, and if there were no gravity, it would just be this nice straight line. So the max and the min are reached half a cycle apart. So one half of a period after the maximum is reached, the string comes to its minimum. And then one half a period later, from that half a cycle later, it's back up to the maximum again. It's, it's flopping between the max and the min positions. So um, <clears throat> here's the second uh, harmonic. And this, this is called the first harmonic, or the fundamental uh, pattern of vibration. Now, I think you might have noticed <clears throat> in the video that this was the slowest of the three. In fact, the fellow showing these, demonstrating these, <clears throat> said that um, this second harmonic was at twice the frequency. In fact, we'll prove that in just a second. Here's a node where there's no vibration and anti-nodes here and here, etc. Still the same fixed ends, still the same length. So this uh, bar down at the bottom represents the length of the string, which isn't changing from uh, pattern to pattern. What is changing is the frequency and the um, the harmonic number. So this is called the first harmonic or the fundamental. This is called the second harmonic, sometimes called the first overtone. When you talk about uh, sounds producing overtones, that's what we're talking about here. This is the first overtone of the fundamental. <coughs> and this is the third harmonic or the second overtone. Now one way to remem remember it, for me it's uh, <coughs> It's, <clears throat> it's easiest just to think about this in terms of the number of lobes, L-O-B-E-S. There's one lobe here, or one loop. Uh, this one has two loops, one, two. This one has three. three, three lobes or three loops. And that, those numbers happen to coincide with these uh, names that we've given them. The first harmonic, the second harmonic has two lobes or loops and then the third harmonic. <clears throat> okay, so that's, uh, we've done A and C. We drew them, we've named them. Now part B, write the wavelength and the frequency of each pattern in terms of the string length L and the wave speed V. So I wanna relate the wavelength to the length of the string. The easiest one to do of these three is the second one. <clears throat> What's the wavelength of that pattern and vibration? And how is it related to the length L? And you might say, well, it looks to me, Dr. Edwards, that this from here to here is one wavelength. And I would say, yeah, it is. You're looking at two axis crossings, both positive axis crossings here. Um, it is one wavelength. So the wavelength is equal to the length for this second pattern, for the second harmonic. And I hope you'll allow me to write it like that. L wavelength equals L. It's also equal to 2L over 2, because 2 divided by 2 is 1. Uh, you'll see the reason for writing it this way in just a second. So the wavelength equals the length. Well, what about this one? Um, we need to see if we can find a wavelength in here. Well, and you say, well, hang on. From here to here looks like a wavelength to me. And I would say, I totally agree. So if this is the wavelength between here and here for this harmonic, then how is it related to the length? Well, the length goes all the way to here, from here to here. And how much of the length is that wavelength? And you say, well, looks to me 
like the wavelength is two-thirds of the length. And I would totally agree. So what about this one? This one's the hardest one, but not so hard now. I want to know what the wavelength of this pattern is. And you say, well, hang on, there isn't even a whole wavelength in there. That's only a half a wavelength. And in fact, that's the answer. The, the wavelength of this sinusoidal curve is actually all the way out to here. That's the wavelength. To get one wavelength, you have to go twice the length. So the wavelength is twice the length, just like that. So I think you can see a pattern here. This wavelength is 2L divided by 1. This is 2L divided by 2. This is 2L divided by 3. That's why I wrote this one as 2L over 2, so you could see that pattern. Now, we have now found the wavelength of each pattern in terms of the string length L. And the final thing that we need to do in this concept, and I'm expecting all of you to know how to do this. It's, it's not that hard, and it's kind of fun, and it's great to impress your friends. Um, how are we going to find the frequency? Well, we've done a bunch of problems like this. We know that V is F lambda. V is wave speed. F is frequency. Uh, lambda is the wavelength. And if we want to find the frequency, all we have to do is divide both sides by the wavelength. And the frequency, the wavelengths will cancel here. And the frequency, therefore, becomes V over lambda. So we'll use that relationship to find the frequencies for each of these. The frequency is going to be... Now, an important point here is that the speed hasn't changed from... from uh, harmonic to harmonic. It's still the same. All right, frequency is V over lambda. What's lambda? Well, it's 2L. Happy day. There's the frequency of the first harmonic. What's the frequency of the second harmonic? Well, it's V over lambda, but a different lambda now. Lambda is 2L over 2, and I'm going to keep that two, the 2's in there, and you'll see why. V over lambda. So I've got to put this thing in the denominator. So that'll put a 2L here, and then it'll put a 2 in the numerator. And then finally, the frequency here, also V over lambda. But lambda is now 2L over 3. So I have to put 2L over 3. OK, any pattern here. This frequency is V over 2L. This frequency, or the second harmonic, is V over 2L times 2. And this frequency is V over 2L times 3. So this is a proof to the statement that was made in the YouTube video that I showed at the beginning that the frequency of this second harmonic is twice the frequency of the fundamental. And we're actually going to use these numbers to denote these frequencies. These are denoted as n, the harmonic number, Here's n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. And we're going to call this f1, the, fun, the frequency of the fundamental. We're going to call this f2. And the cool thing about f2 is that it's 2 times f1. v over 2l is just f1. And then finally, f3 is 3 times f1. That's the way that works. I think we've done the whole concept. So this is a summary 
of what we've seen so far. F1, the fundamental, the fundamental is V over 2L, and it looks like this. In this case, I've got both the maximum and the minimum denoted by solid lines instead of one being dotted. Um, this is called the second harmonic, or the first overtone. It's twice the frequency of the fundamental. Um, the third harmonic, three times the frequency of the fundamental. That whole process continues indefinitely. There's actually an infinite number of harmonics that are possible on a string with, with fixed ends. And we've just figured out what they are. So essentially, this just captures everything we've done already in a single concept. You already know everything in this concept. But I wanted to have you actually write it down. Write down and name the series of natural frequencies of a string with fixed ends. The series of natural frequencies of a string with fixed ends is called the harmonic series. That's what it's called. Um, Fn is n times F1. This is true for any value of n, including n equals 1. If n equals 1, it's called the harmonic number, like we talked about before. If n equals 1, then this formula says that F1, since n is 1, equals 1 times F1. And you say, hang on, Dr. Edwards, that's just F1. And F1 equals F1, that is definitely a true statement. So what about for the other ones? Well, what about for n equals 2? Then F2, we're putting a 2 in here, equals 2 times F1. And that's exactly the kind of thing that we're looking at here. This is this relationship here. F2 equals twice F1, which is what the guy said in the video. The frequency is twice. F1 is V over 2L. Um, and I would expect you to, to, to be able to know that. That's the fundamental frequency. What happens, uh, does the frequency make sense? And, and I think uh, the best physicists will always, and you're going to be great physicists, <laughs> Best physicists will always try and understand the equation, try and look at how the result effect, uh, is affected by changes in any of the variables. If you increase the speed of the um, speed of the wave, then you can expect the frequency to increase, and uh, and that's certainly true. If you increase the length of the string, you can expect the frequency to decrease. Longer string is going to have, is going to be a slower oscillation and a lower frequency. Longer period, lower frequency. Uh, where V is the speed of the waves on the string and L is the string length. So that's that. Um, the harmonic series is uh, is responsible for defining the most important intervals in Western music. And we can demonstrate that using my violin. Um, So what I'm going to try and do is, is produce these, um, these different harmonics on my violin. So I'm going to, um, and I'm going to note here that this is a string that's fixed at both ends. This is called the nut, where the string goes over this little piece of wood here. And this is called the bridge, the string goes over the bridge here. Actually, it's not technically f completely fixed end here because the string causes the bridge to vibrate which causes the front plate to vibrate, which causes the air to get sent out into your ears. But it's close enough. It's vibrating very, very little. Uh, and for the purposes of this uh, discussion, it's, it's not vibrating at all. So the first, uh, the fundamental, or the first harmonic, and maybe you can see, maybe you can't, through the camera, that we've got a node here, 
a node here and an anti-node right about here in the middle. Just see if you can see that string vibrating at all in the camera. So if I can see it, it is vibrating a lot in there. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. So what you can do, and that one, I'd like to get that pitch into your head. That's this, um, this fundamental note right here. In fact, it's a G that I'm just playing right here. It's G in this particular case. So, um, bomb. What I'm going to do now is to place my finger right uh, halfway between the nut and the bridge and cause this string to vibrate in two pieces. Now by doing this, I'm not placing my finger hard against the keyboard. Instead, I'm just lightly touching the string so that the string will vibrate in two equal segments. So this part will be vibrating, and this part will also be vibrating. Some of you that play the guitar do this also. It's, it's called harmonics. And what's the musical relationship between that fundamental and this first overtone or second harmonic? It's an octave. For those of you that have some musical, relation, uh, musical training, F2, the frequency of the second harmonic, divided by F1, the frequency of the fundamental, is 2. And any time you have a frequency ratio of 2, you get an octave. Uh, an octave is 8 notes on the piano keyboard. Let's look at a couple more. So this is F1, F1, F2, F3, where now we're causing this to vibrate in three lobes. What's the relationship between this octave and this, um, between F2 and F3. Cool, I can use my bow to do that. Uh, it's bom, bom. That's called a musical fifth. And the frequency ratio there is since F3, so this is F3 is 3F1, F2 is 2F1 according to the harmonic series. The F1s cancel, and we got that that's equal to three halves, or one and a half. So anytime you have two frequencies whose frequency ratio is one and a half, you get a perfect fifth. And that's the distance between five, five notes on the piano keyboard. A couple more, let's see then, this one here, the fourth harmonic, so here's the fundamental, the fir oh, it's the first harmonic, Second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic. Mom. And uh, what's the musical relationship between this one and this one? And the answer is. Mom, mom. That's an octave. So we've got another octave coming out of this deal, and you would have known that because this is twice the frequency of that. If you don't know what an octave is, all you, all you need to know is, is how to sing somewhere over the rainbow. Somewhere over the rainbow. But those first two notes are an octave apart. Then the next, I uh, just want to do a couple more. The uh, relationship between um, harmonic five and harmonic four. Here's four. <coughs> boom, boom. That's a major third, so-called in in uh, music, it's uh, where three notes on the piano keyboard. And then the seventh is F7 divided by F4. And that's a seventh. Some bom, 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 bom is a seventh chord. And that has a frequency ratio of 1.75. The third has a frequency ratio of 1.25. How do I know that? F5 is 5F1. F4 is 4F1. 5 divided by F4 is 1.25. Bingo. So, uh, actually this harmonic series is useful, uh, and it's used in all, all different kinds of instruments. Trumpet, uh, bugles, before uh, trumpets were invented, um, people just played bugles that have no valves. As we will talk about later, 
not, the violin isn't the only instrument whose frequencies obey the harmonic series. The bugle and the trumpet and uh, many other instruments do too, the clarinet, the flute, etc. And um, so the bugle, all you are left with is to be able to, all you can do, since you don't have any valves, is to use your lips to control the pitch of the instrument and, um, and to select from among your choices of these harmonics which ones you're going to play. Push your lips closer together, cause them to vibrate faster, then you get the higher harmonics. And you can do the same thing on the violin to, do, um, to pick out the particular harmonics that you want in order to, um, to play without ever pushing the fingers hard down on the keyboard. Let's see. So there's Reveille on the violin. Thank you very much. Um, all this combines together to, to, to make music. Um, let me do a little bit of that later on. So that is the harmonic series. The uh, equal tempered chromatic scale fits 12 semitones, so called half steps. into each octave. So the idea here with equal temperament, which guitars are equally tempered instruments, and, and how they do it is they, they, they put the frets on here with a certain frequency ratio for each one. And what you want to do is, is to um, increase the frequency by a factor of two to the one twelfth power between each semitone in the scale. So if you start with a C scale, a C would be a certain frequency. You multiply that by two to the one twelfth power to get a C sharp. And then you multiply that uh, frequency for C sharp again by two to the one twelfth power to get D, etc., up the 12 note uh, semitone scale. Two to the one twelfth is about 1.06. So that's how equal temperament is, is, is done. It's done that way approximately on the piano, except for the uh, violations that the piano has of the harmonic series. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So um, what you, what you want to do is you, if you want to get from C, middle C, to the next C up, you're going to multiply by 2 to the 1 12th power to get C sharp, then multiply again by 2 to the 1 12th power to get D, etc. And you do that 12 times. So the idea is then 2 to the 1 12 times 2 to the 1 12 12 times gives 2 to the 12 over 12 power. Well, 2 to the 12 over 12 is just 2 to the 1 over 1, which is just 2 to the 1, which is just 2. And so what you've done is you've, you've gone up one octave. We've proved previously that one octave is where you multiply the frequency by 2. And, um, and in fact, what, that's what equal temperament does is to actually um, give you the, the guarantee that the octaves are correct. The trouble is with equal temperament is that the um, other intervals are not correct. We've talked about the, the perfect fifth being a ratio of 3 to 2 or 1.5. The major third being a ratio of 5 to 4 or 1.25. The, um, the um, minor seventh being a ratio of 7 to 4, 1.75. The equal temperament that's used on pianos and guitars, etc., doesn't get all these intervals uh, equally uh, well. And let me demonstrate that for you. So, an equal tempered third Sounds like that. That's what you're used to. You've heard that on the piano and, and other instruments. A perfect third that obeys a harmonic series sounds like this. 
you say, wow, that sounds a little bit narrow. Um, and in fact, it is. It has a frequency ratio of 1.25, as we talked about before, um, whereas equal temperament is uh, 1.26. It's a little wide. Who's at fault? Who's right? Harmonic series is right. That's where these intervals came from. And equal temperament is, uh, is just an approximation to the pure intervals you can get with, the, with equal temperament. Now, equal temperament does a pretty good job with the fifth. Uh, a fifth is seven semitones, seven half steps to go up a fifth, and that gives a frequency ratio of 1.498. Now, if you listen to that carefully, you can hear some beats. So listen and see if you can hear the beat frequency. Oh. Wah. Can you see the wah, 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 wah? And the reason is the harmonics that produced by each of these notes above them beat against each other. Here's a perfect fifth with a ratio of 1.5. Nice and restful, no beats whatsoever. A seventh um, is ten semitones. Now that one is beating really, really fast. It's going wah, 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 wah. And if you listen, you can probably hear that. And here is a, um, here's a, uh, harmonic seventh. Nice and restful, uh, beautiful interval, but some with musical training will say, well, that's flat. That's definitely flat. That's not, long, that's not big enough to be a minor seventh. But uh, barbershop harmony, um, in, in barbershop groups actually tune their voices since they can pick any frequency they want to with their voices and they're not fixed uh, like a guitar or a piano to a certain set of frequencies, they tune to each other and they tend to adopt that harmonic tuning. And um, that's where the ringing seventh chord sounds that you hear that is characteristic of barbershop uh, melodies. It's said that over 60% of the chords in barbershop should be seventh chords. Um, and a seventh chord is, a, is the note, a third above it, a fifth above that, and then a seventh above that. So you got four guys, four girls uh, sing, singing, um, singing that. And this is a, the seventh chord in equal temperament. Can you hear the beats? Wah, 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 wah. Here is the seventh chord in harmonic tuning. And, and for uh, barber shoppers, that's called the ring. When you get that seventh low enough and the major third low enough and the fifth is right on the money, it just sounds beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. Um, we talked about the, the various intervals on the piano keyboard. The octave uh, is eight notes on the keyboard from C to C shown here. It's 12 semitones and a factor of two in the frequency. Um, you can remember it as somewhere over the rainbow. A seventh is uh, there's a place for us. Those first two notes are a seventh apart, minor seventh from West Side Story. Um, the fifth, uh, if you don't know what a fifth is, you can remember it as uh, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Twinkle, twinkle, that's a fifth. And then uh, if you know I heard the bells on Christmas Day, that gives you a third. Uh, I heard the bells on, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, a little musical training there. Am I expecting you to know all this? Um, actually, no, but I love it, and I thought I'd share it with you. It's not in a fundamental concept, but uh, those of you that are interested in this, um, well, some might be interested in it. Um, okay, this, this does pertain to <laughs> what we're talking about in class and, and is a relevant example to, to um, the exams. What if a rope of length L is clamped at both ends? So here's my rope of length L, clamped at both ends, and which one of the following is not a possible wavelength for standing waves on this rope? Well, if you remember, the wavelengths that we came up with for um, first harmonic, the wavelength 
was twice the length. Remember, because we couldn't fit a whole wavelength into that length of the rope. The second harmonic was 2L over 2. The third harmonic was 2L over 3, and etc. So which of the following is not possible? What's the next one going to be? And you say, well, I know that. It's 2L over 4, following the same pattern, etc. Then 2L over 5. So which ones uh, are not possible wavelengths? What about this one? Is that possible? Well, that one's right there, L over 2. So that one's certainly possible. What about 2L over 3? Well, that one's right here, so that's possible. Uh, what about L? Well, that one's right here, so that's definitely a possible wavelength. What about 2L? Well, that one's right here, that's possible. What about 4L? Can we get 4L? And the answer is no. Um, the biggest that wavelength can be is 2L. It can never be as big as 4L. So the an this is the answer. Okay, um, guitar string vibrates in its fundamental pattern. What is the distance from the fixed end of a string? So here's a fixed end, the, the nut, so-called, at least that's called on the violin, from the, or to the nearest anti-node. What's an anti-node? It's a place where the string is vibrating with maximum amplitude. So here's an anti-node. And I want to know this distance from the fixed end of the string to that nearest anti-node. Well, if this is vibrating in its fundamental mode, remember that an entire wavelength is this long. And so the wavelength here is twice the length vibrating in the fundamental mode. Well, so the length, therefore, so how much is this distance here? That's the wavelength. This is half a wavelength, and this here must be, therefore, one quarter of a wavelength. So here's a quarter wavelength to here, another quarter wavelength to here, another quarter wavelength to here, and then another quarter wavelength to here. Four quarter wavelengths to add up. So the answer here is um, lambda over 4. I'll give you some homework to practice on that.